This is the second Thursday of the month. This is a program that the New Concord Historical Society puts on on a regular basis. So we hope you'll come back to the second Thursday of next month. But I, it's, right now it's a surprise who's going to be here because we haven't totally confirmed it. So I hope you'll come back to the second Thursday of October for the next presentation at 7 o'clock here at Kimball Jenkins Estate. Okay, my name is Kathleen Bailey. I'm a writer, author, and journalist by trade. And I grew up here on the Heights in the 50s and 60s. So I know Concord, I love Concord, and when I had a chance to jump, write this book, I jumped at it. My daughter Sheila is my co-author and she did all the contemporary photos. My father was a photographer on the Heights, Alfred Perrin. So when he died, my family received the benefit of 50 years of slides and negatives. My nephew Stephen, who's in the second row, cheerfully dragged them upstairs from my dad's musty basement. And I began the process of scanning them in and culling them. It was quite a career. In addition to portraits and weddings, and engagements in high school. He also did work for the union leader and the monitor. So there were a lot of negatives to process. But that was the genesis of growing up in Concord, New Hampshire. This is our third book with Arcadia Publishing. I don't go to class reunions. Let's get that out of the way. But I keep coming back to Concord looking for the things that shaped my character, looking for the things that made me who I am. Growing up isn't linear, it's circular. And you're always looking for yourself in bits and places, pieces of the places you lived. It's like Frankie Valley says, girl, you can't leave the places where you were born. Growing up in Concord, we had a lot of common ground, especially in the 50s and 60s. It really wasn't a city. It was a city on paper, but it was really more of a glorified small town. Manchester was a city. Concord was not. Concord had one homogenous culture, and we all fit into it. We all went to matinees at the Capitol Theater. We bought our Beatle albums at French's. We went to J.C. Penney's to watch the cash box go up and down the wire. That was a real thrill. Concord did have its ethnic population. We had a small Greek community, a small Jewish community. We had Italians. We had French Canadians. We had Swedes who came to Concord to work in the granite quarry. If we ate souvlaki or smorgasbord or spaghetti bolognese at home, it didn't show up out in public. Our parents may have practiced the old country ways behind the front door, but we shared a culture. Here's our Phoenix Hall. And by the way, it is P-H-E-N-I-X. There is no O in Phoenix. Our Phoenix does not rise from the ashes with an O. It was a dingy red brick city, dirty at times. And in our era of growing up, there was not a lot of new construction. What we tended to do was move new businesses into old or carve businesses out of other spaces. For example, the Junior Deb Shop, which probably was a closet when it started out. Oh, this is one of my favorites. 
Governor Powell on the State House Plaza welcoming a group of people from a rodeo that was showing in Manchester. Chances are it was his first rodeo. Many of us wanted to get away. We saw ourselves as tortured, sensitive souls stuck in a provincial backwater. You know, it kind of like throw a rock and you hit Jack Kerouac. My friends and I used to spend a dollar to go to Manchester on the bus so we could ride the escalator at Parizos. We were such rubes. My friend Paul Brogan used to spend a dollar and take the bus to Manchester. He would bribe the desk clerk at the Carpenter Motor Hotel to let him ride the elevator. And he would ride the elevator to the top and look out over the rooftops of Manchester. Paul sensed another world. A lot of us sensed another world. And a lot of us were able to get away, some of us to college. The rich kids on the hill went to private colleges. The rest of us got schlepped off to UNH. But we, we were OK with that, because it was more than our parents had had. Other people got out of Concord through the military. And others got out of it through job transfers. We didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world. A little six-year-old girl stood on the steps of an elementary school with an armed guard so that she could go inside and have the same education as other children. That was integration. We didn't deal with integration here because there was no one to integrate. Nine teenagers tried to enter a high school in Arkansas with an armed guard. And again, it didn't really touch us because it wasn't an issue here. The war was very much still with us especially with our parents and especially with our dads, but they didn't talk about it. If they liberated a concentration camp, they kept it to themselves. We read the diary of Anne Frank, but that didn't really tell us what went on because it ended when the jackboots came up the stairs. Our parents may have watched the Nuremberg hearings, but if they did, it was after we went to bed. A war raged in Korea, but if you didn't have a brother or a cousin or a neighbor who was deployed, it didn't really touch you. We were oblivious, and I think our parents wanted it that way. They had survived a depression and the major war of the 20th century. And in a sense, they sheltered us from the outside world, and especially Concord did a really good job of sheltering. The outside world was to come in, but not during our childhoods. In the 50s and 60s, Concord was a city of neighborhoods. Mom either didn't drive or she couldn't drive because dad took the family car to work. There was no comprehensive or convenient bus service. So we, we relied on the neighborhood. We went to neighborhood stores, we went to neighborhood playgrounds, we, just about everybody walked to school. One of the neighborhood stores in my neighborhood was Clark's. And Clark's was something that I have never seen again. Laura, did you ever go to Clark's when you were up on the Heights? No. no. OK. Well, you probably have your own store memories. But Clark's was run by these two women, 80-year-old Ada Clark 
and her daughter Dorothy. Ada did all the bookkeeping, all the ordering, and all the gas pumping because Dottie was too fat to move. She stayed behind the counter, she sold the candy bars, and she gossiped. They lived behind the store, so they were pretty much there 24-7. I have one memory of a gas emergency with my parents on a holiday. I don't remember if it was Thanksgiving or Christmas, but we were out of gas, we were going someplace, and we stopped at Clark's. My father got Ada out, up from her Thanksgiving turkey, but he was too much of a gentleman to let her pump, 24-7. Find someone who does that today, even the most dedicated small business owner. You close on Thanksgiving. Another notorious store on the Heights was the Tom Collins. Just up the road from me, the Tom Collins did not serve Tom Collinses. But the owners had a cavalier, laissez-faire attitude toward, wait for it, selling beer to underage boys. So Tom Collins had quite the reputation. We also had a lot of enterprising businessmen. This one spot, which is the mattress store now, was first owned by Paul Brogan's family it was the Lone Star Dairy Bar. It's hard to imagine elegant Clara Brogan flipping hamburgers, but there you are. Then it was taken off by, over by the Cusano family, who ran Dan's My Long Hot Dogs for several years. And most Concord kids knew Dan's My Long Hot Dogs from the slushy wagon that they drove around town for all the band concerts. And the actual corner store, corner with a K, the corner cupboard in West Concord, which served West Concord's needs. Kids spent a lot of time at neighborhood playgrounds, again, because they could walk to them. Uh, this is a skating rink at Merrill Playground, the city of Concord generously flooded skating rinks in just about every park. Children also played games at Doyen Park, which is no more. It was taken down to put in a parking lot. Thank you, Joni Mitchell. But Doyen Park was right behind the old courthouse. And one of my acquaintances remembers playing Sandlot Baseball in Doyen Park. They used the World War I Memorial for a backstop. And they frequently put baseballs through the windows of the courthouse, enabling the clerk of court, Henry Diust, to come out and yell at them. Wherever we were in Concord, we weren't too far from nature. I lived on the Heights, and we didn't have vacant lots. The whole neighborhood was a vacant lot, broken up by houses. But other children had nature that they could walk to. Sandy and Jimmy Pinfield lived on Linden Street, and they were able to walk to this pond by the cemetery. East Concord has, regrettably, the most unusual nickname for a neighborhood. Its nickname is Peckerville, poor East Concord. But it actually came from a war hero, Colonel John Pecker. And he actually has a monument off of Mountain Road. Sheila and I had to drive by there about 10 times before we found it, but it is a monument. When we were old enough, which was a lot younger in the 50s than it would be today. 
we were allowed to go downtown by ourselves. We called it Down Street. But downtown had everything. Clothing stores, an Army Navy store, two bookstores, Gibson's and the Apple Tree, two stores at French's, a toy store for the little kids and a record store for the older kids, and the Granite State Candy Shop. At one point, we had four five and dimes. We had a Kresge's, Newberry's, Woolworth's, and briefly a W.T. Grant. Woolworth's was our garden of earthly delights. You could get anything there. Your first makeup, school supplies, goldfish that died on the way home, but whatever. And I remember they had these wonderful lamps at the back of the store. The shades were treated with something that allowed them the design to move. When you lit the lamp, the design on the shade would move, whether it was galloping ponies or the ocean. Anybody remember those? Great lamps. For some reason, my parents never allowed me to get one. Warren Street was even quainter with a dress stop shop, a jewelry shop, the first iteration of Granite State Candy, and inexplicably, the police station. Go figure. One of my correspondents, Ken Jordan, would go down to downtown every Saturday morning and meet his buddies. They had a regular routine. Go to Haggett's and look at the latest sporting equipment, go to the Army-Navy store, which was still selling real Army-Navy stuff. You could get a Springfield rifle for $2. Fortunately, the barrel was fused shut. Then they'd go to the old railroad station, and they'd play on the Concord coach. It's a miracle that thing survived. I don't imagine they'd be allowed to do that today. Downtown was also a boom to that housewife who didn't drive. My family's time downtown was always Friday night. My father would drive us down after supper at Keniston's. He'd put a nickel in the meter. He and I would go to the places that we were interested in. And that maybe took an hour. And then we'd come back and sit in the car and wait for my mother. Mom went everywhere. She went to Who's Apparel Shop, even though we didn't have a formal event coming up. She went to the Army-Navy store, even though we didn't hunt, fish, or camp. She went to all four of the Five and Dimes because she knew people in every one of them. She called them the girls. She shopped until the stores began shutting off their lights at 9 o'clock. And I was an adult, many years an adult, before I realized that it wasn't about shopping. And here's a fun blast from the past, the Giant Store. The Giant Store was unlike anything I have seen in my life, and I have lived a long time. The Giant Store was a discount store that moved into an old factory in Penacook. It literally moved into the factory. They didn't get rid of any of the factory junk. They just brought in all the discounted merchandise on top of it. So it was very dirty and probably not safe. The merchandise was leftovers, overstocks, and things that probably shouldn't have been made in the first place. But if you looked very carefully, you could find gems among the dirt. My mother wouldn't let us buy food there, and I guess I could see why. 
The 50s and 60s also saw a new breed of supermarket. This is the first national on Hall Street. And this happy customer and happy salesperson are enthusing over the fact that they can now get a receipt printed out with the numbers on it. What an age we live in. The Capital Shopping Center, AKA Brits, was the first, not nail in the coffin of Main Street, but the first indicator that there was more to life than Main Street. This is our beloved Mayor Davey at the opening ceremonies. Nobody cut a ribbon like Mayor Davey. He was like a mayor from Central Casting. Uh, the little kid is singing the national anthem, but Brits didn't kill Main Street. Brits just gave us another option. The thing that really killed Main Street was the Kmarts, the Walmarts, all the other Marts, the Bradleys, the Kings, places that were open six nights a week till nine o'clock, and they had mass-produced merchandise, and they were convenient. So that was where Main Street began its decline. The malls were also the precursors to killing Main Street. And this is kind of a sensitive subject right now, so I'm not going to go too into it with this crowd. But on the left, you see Armand de Monte and Mayor Herbie Quinn and a couple of town officials describing his dream for the Steeplegate Mall. And on the right, you see the Steeplegate Mall after it was pretty much closed. In our lifetimes, we have seen the five and dime replaced by the department stores, the department stores replaced by the mall, the mall replaced by TJ Maxx and Marshalls, and the internet. And it's interesting to speculate about what's coming next. I am sorry to see the end of the malls, though, because where else do you dump your tween on a Saturday afternoon? Okay, okay so Main Street did come back at a multi-million dollar restoration. And it's pretty good right now. It's a good place to go. It's not the Main Street of old, but it's better than it could have been. People tout this concept as the new Main Street, the mixed use developments, the walkable community. Dave and I go to Londonderry a lot and we have to pass through the Woodmont Commons. I call it the abomination of desolation. The concept between a lot of city planners is that the mixed use development is the new main street. You live in the condos or apartments on the third floor. Businesses like doctors and lawyers are on the second floor. Stores and hairdressers on the first floor. Everybody's happy. You can walk to anything you need. But guys, that's not Main Street. It never was. It never will be. Main Street grew organically. And it grew organically to meet people's needs. A World War II veteran opened a hardware store. An immigrant opened a bakery. It was made for the housewife who didn't or couldn't drive. The 
young secretary on a budget who had to walk to work, the kid with the allowance. And that was our Main Street. But Concord's Main Street is now someplace people would actually want to be. There's outdoor dining, there's the farmer's market, there's events up the wazoo, there's Mexican dining, Thai dining, award-winning coffee shops, even a branch of Cheers. It's not what it was, but hey, it's not bad. This is the Runlet Junior High School Quill staff in 1966. And observe the outfits. These are the kids that didn't want to go to Bishop Brady because they wore uniforms. And look at how placid and polite they are. In another 10 years, their world will be overthrown and overturned. School was a big part of our lives, and it was important. If you came from a chaotic household, school provided order and discipline. If you came from an organized household, school built upon that organization. Millville schools combined fifth and sixth grades, conquered smallest school, sometime in the early 60s. School spirit. On the right are the Runlet Majorettes in 1966. On the left are the Runlet Cheerleaders in 1966. I love the outfits. That's what they wore just before they went over the mountains to escape the Nazis. Okay, Dame School play. It was Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Dougie Collier was Baby Bear. Alan Drew was the pan with the pan pipes. They had to expand the story to give a part for everybody. So I don't know what the guys are in the back, but somebody found a role for you. Ah, this is one of my favorites. My fifth grade class play, A Salute to the 50 States. And we had to go through the principal, the school board, and the Harper Valley PTA for the girls to be able to show their midriffs. Love the 50s. This is a Dewey School play sometime in the late 1950s, and I have no idea what's going on. School. We weren't really diverse because there was no one to be diverse with. This is the Happy Hollow Preschool, their international pageant. And this is their idea of diversity. Change was to come slowly, but when it did, Concord embraced it. Young girls perform a Colombian folk dance at the Market Days Festival. I love that. Okay, the returning G.I. Joes and their Janes brimmed with energy. They had just whooped Hitler. They could do anything. And they turned that energy into joining clubs. Concord in the 50s bristled with clubs. We had your, you had your Elks, your Moose, your Eagles, your Elks, your Moose, your Eagles Auxiliary, Women of the Moose, I like that. You had, 
and because the war was so fresh, you had your DAV, your VFW, your American Legion. Conquered people jumped at the chance to go out at night, dress up, wear a sash or a funny hat, and learn a password. Okay, this is Heights boys on their way to Eagle Scout on the left. And on the right is the Fraternal Order of Eagles installing new officers. Even mom got into the act because with the advent of boxed cake mixes and really terrible TV dinners, even mom had more time on her hands. I believe the one on the left is Eastern Star and the one on the right is Emblem Club. Then we have fun here. On the left is the Zonta Club. If you look closely, you can see a person in the phone booth. And on the right is the East Concord Garden Club. I have no idea what they're toasting, but it looks like they're having a high old time. Most clubs or churches at one point or other managed to put on a variety show. And these could be anything from fascinating and exciting to full bore boring to horrifying, depending on the talent they were able to round up. This one has a little bit of everything, Keystone Cops, banjo players, can-can dancers, although in this particular instance, they should probably ca be called can't-can't, or maybe you shouldn't. The variety show usually also had a little bit of labored humor involving men dressing up as women. Concord outgrew the racist minstrel shows fairly soon, which is to our credit. But the variety show lived on well into the 70s. The other fun thing we did was fashion shows. Wow, all that stuff might be worth something someday. Another fashion show, the one on the left is by the Bankers Association, although we must assume that these lovely ladies trying on clothes were the wives or the secretaries of the bankers because there were very few female bankers in the 50s and 60s. And on the right, two gorgeous children prepare for the St. Peter's Guild fashion show. The little boy is Harold Extrabrook. I've never been able to identify the girl. Uh, the Concord Camera Club, that gave the best Halloween parties. On the left, Bill and Annie Pinfield, dressed as their favorite hobby. Today, they'd have to come as phones. On the right, the Curtis family of Warner. Um, Harold Kimball, dressed as a convict, which wasn't too much of a stretch because he did work at the prison. And on the right, an installation of the Masons, the only men in the 50s that wore aprons. Hats! No well-dressed club woman would appear downtown without a hat. These are some of my favorites. And I really love this one from the Concord Women's Club. Two women admiring a third woman's hat. I don't know what those things are coming out of her head. I don't know if they're candy canes or if they're little drunks leaning on lampposts in homage to Carlin's Cafe. Another way people use their energy was to be in community theater. This is two different productions of the importance of being earnest. 
The one on the left is the community players. The one on the right is the St. Paul's Drama Club. Notice that they use the same blocking. And we did have screen time. It just wasn't the same as today's screen time. We had three Boston stations. We had one really clunky PBS station out of Durham that the gym teacher had to manipulate the antennas for you to get an educational program. And we had Channel 9. Channel 9, before it affiliated with ABC, was something to be seen. Channel 9 created its own programming. One of it was the Uncle Gus show. And one of the rallying cries for my generation is, was you on the Uncle Gus show? Most of us were. Gus Bernier was a true Renaissance man. Every afternoon at four, he put on his polo shirt, funny hat, and he entertained other people's kids for an hour. His show was sponsored by Jiffy Pop and Bonomo Turkish Taffy, so I think he was on the take from a dentist. Then after the show, he would change into his white shirt and jacket and go down the hall and deliver the news. And then he would take off the jacket and stand there in the white shirt and deliver the weather. Then he'd put the jacket back on for the news wrap-up. Uncle Gus was many things, but not the kiddie show pervert of the urban legend. Really, when would he have had the time? Their other homegrown program that has stuck in our memories, like a pebble in a shoe, is the Clyde Joy Show. Clyde Joy was a country singer out of Manchester. He sang in the traditional nasal country style. We're not talking Brad Paisley here. He even yodeled. Clyde Joe had a half hour show every Saturday night just before Lawrence Welk. And the highlight of the show was when he took off his cowboy hat to sing a hymn. And the bare studio light shone down on his bald head. We waited for it every week. Clyde Joy also had one of the most bizarre theme songs that has ever come out of local television. He was sponsored by Freddie Goodnight the mobile home king of Hooks at New Hampshire. And he created a song to the tune of Good Night Irene. Sing it with me. Freddy, good night. For, come on, sing with me. Freddy, good night. For the very best buy on a mobile home, see Freddy, good night. Truly an appalling piece of music. And I have it on good account that after they outlawed waterboarding, the CAIA took up the Freddie Goodnight song to get information out of terrorists. They usually broke after 24 hours. We had unscheduled time too. Kirk and Karen DeVoid lived on the Heights next to the Tom Collins store. They had a big front porch, and in the winter, they liked to bundle up and sit on the porch. Karen told me that there was one spot that always iced over, and they would watch and bet on who was going to spin out. We were fearless. Royal Ford's father raced motorcycles, and Royal Ford shared with me this chilling tale 
of going out in the field with his dad and his dad attaching the kids to parachutes and then riding his motorcycle across the field until they were airborne. Yeah, try doing that today. Royal Ford also shared with me about coming home from school on Chase Street to his home on Branch Turnpike and when the road was iced over, hanging on to the back of the mail truck and getting a free ride. Try doing that today. But perhaps the toughest was Jim Wentworth. Jim Wentworth had asthma. He was home from school one day. His mother checked on him. And then she went about her work. Jim managed to break his inhaler. And instead of telling his mother, he got wrapped up and bundled up despite his cold, walked all the way down the Loudon Road Hill to Fortier's Pharmacy, bought himself a new inhaler, and was home and back in bed before his mother noticed he was missing. We were tough 50s kids, but maybe it's just because we didn't know better. Okay. We had community events such as the police department visiting Santa. Uh, we had civil defense preparing for the inevitable, which never came. My father had a fallout shelter. And then we all came together one last time for some innocent fun in 1965, the Bicentennial. On the left, Mayor Davey with the Bicentennial Bells chapter at the City Hall. On the right, Mayor Davey and Congressman Jim Cleveland on the Concord coach. Mayor Davey was, again, the ideal mayor to shepherd something like a bicentennial. He was perfect. We had kangaroo courts. We were all dorks together, and it didn't bother us. This is the burial of Mr. Ray Zor, the commitment that the men made to stop shaving. And there are some men who grew beards, and there on the left is somebody we know and love. Jim, wake up. We got to you. Mm -hmm. We got to you. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very special time, and it was the last time that we could all get together for some innocent small town fun before the world came in. And come in, it did. Religion was part of our lives. There's the Catholic Daughters of America living rosary. Um, the Catholic meat ban. What did it mean to give up meat if you really, really, really liked fish? St. John's in its heyday. A very serious group of Lutheran confirmation kids. I would not want to tackle with them. And on the right, our favorite mayor at an Episcopalian prayer breakfast. Ours was also the first generation to use the where were you when concept. Our parents had it to a degree. Nobody, nobody would ever forget where they were for VE Day or VJ Day. But we refined it to an art because we're special. So it, it matters where we were when. Uh, there's our handsome young presidential candidate meeting with the postal workers. There he is kissing babies. There he is with 
Mary Kirk Pierce, a descendant of President Franklin Pierce. Kennedy's assassination threw a wrench into our peaceful young lives. It was the first experience most of us had had with loss, because we were still young, so we hadn't lost our grandparents, we hadn't lost our parents. The whole country was shattered, and one of the phrases for my generation has continued to be, where were you when you heard? Most of us were in school, and Paul Brogan remembers a thousand kids filing out of Rundlet in absolute silence. It was the first time we had experienced that kind of loss, and it was the first time we had experienced it as a group. Where were you when Alan Shepard went into space? That was another where were you for our generation. Alan Shepard, who was one of ours, was the first man in space. And in 1971, he hit a golf ball on the moon. I don't know what the point was. They still couldn't find Alice Cramden, but there you are. JFK and Jackie were glamorous and beautiful and intelligent and hip, but still, they belonged to our parents' generation, however cool they were. We needed a 60s for us, and we found it in Beatlemania. Girls dressed like Jane Asher and set their watches to Liverpool time. Boys, if they had any talent at all, or a whisper of talent, formed a band. This is Mark Boisvert on the left with his Christmas guitar. Mark was in several bands. And on the right, Ian Chisholm with the bangs that he refused to cut. Two trips to the principal's office, but hey, Ian was being true to a cause. The other music phenomenon that changed our lives was Motown. Young people whose skin didn't match ours sang of the same joys and sorrows, teenage angst. As we had. And we had to listen, we wanted to listen and there was no going back. It wasn't Dr. King, but it was something. Yeah. Vietnam was the other awakening, and it was a rude awakening. The placid 50s kids were placid no more. It was a time of parents versus children, children versus parents, parents versus the government they just fought for, and a plethora of other social movements sprang out of Vietnam. There was no going back. It was like taking a jigsaw puzzle, turning it over on the floor, and then when you go to put it back together again, the picture has changed. Concord's Vietnam casualties are on the same monument at the State House as her World War II in Korea. These are the names of the boys we lost. I get into this more deeply in the book. Many of us got out, most of us got out that wanted to. And we saw what was beyond the top of the Carpenter Motor Hotel. But many of us came back. We came back with a wider place in our minds and hearts. 
we came back with an experience of other cultures, other ways of thought, other parts of the world, and we brought it here and we're the better for it. It's like Ernest Hemingway says about Paris, Concord is a movable feast. This is my last picture, and this shows the diversity that we have come to cherish over the years. The first picture is kids lining up at Dame School for the 4th of July parade. And the other picture is people painting a diversity mural at Keach Park. So anyway, that's what I got. Questions, comments? Thank you for singing with me. A lot of times they don't. <laughs>